It's time to think differently about healthcare, but how do we keep up? The days of yesterday's medicine are long gone, and we're left trying to figure out where to go from here. With all the talk about politics and technology, it can be easy to forget that healthcare is still all about humans. And many of those humans have unbelievable stories to tell. Here, we leave the policy debates to the other guys and focus instead on the people and ideas that are changing the way we address our health. It's time to navigate the new landscape of healthcare together and hear some amazing stories along the way. Ready for a breath of fresh air? It's time for your Paradigm Shift. Welcome to the Paradigm Shift of Healthcare, and thank you for listening. I'm Michael Roberts, here today with my co-host, Scott Seitzer. On today's episode, we're speaking with John Gorman. He's a chairman of Nightingale Partners, an advisory firm connecting capital to payers and providers of care to the medically underserved. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me, and happy Pandemic Thursday. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Got to find uh, the rays of rays of light in the midst of all this stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. So let's dive right into this because we, we've already started talking about this a little bit before we hit the record button, so to speak. One of the things that I saw about your profile and the, the things that you do with the various audiences that you work with leads me right into this first question. So we're talking about public health, health issues that have you know, really just blown up during this pandemic. You, you know, here in Louisiana, we're dealing with a lot of the realities of social determinants of health in terms of who gets affected the most, who dies the most in our state. Yeah. And, and this isn't just happening in Louisiana. It's happening in a lot of different places all around the country and, and even around the world. But for this for this conversation, we'll just focus here. But it's definitely happening in very disproportionate ways. And there's a lot of a lot of factors to go into that. But, you know, one of the first things I'd like to start on is just like how big a role are we seeing poverty play on these health outcomes? Uh, specific to coronavirus? I mean, all of it, but yes, definitely the coronavirus. Coronavirus is really sort of the microscope that really shows us, you know, how inequality and even systemic racism has really impacted our healthcare system. I mean, you need only look at the death rates of, uh, of African Americans from COVID to really see that People of color, especially low-income people of color with other chronic conditions that typically plague those populations like cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, are all the folks at greatest risk of contracting COVID and dying from it. In fact, in Louisiana, Michigan, Illinois, many other states, we're seeing African Americans die from coronavirus at a rate of uh, two to four times yeah. what they are represented in the population. So, you know, I posted recently on, on LinkedIn that coronavirus is racist as hell and its lethal comorbidity is poverty. And when you have these two things together, it's an excessively lethal combination, especially for people of color. Absolutely. And, and you do a lot of work, you said, like with government groups, but what does somebody outside of the government do in this kind of scenario? Is is there any groups that can really help change this dynamic in any way? Well, absolutely. I mean, certainly health systems, health payers, you know, other stakeholders in our industry have an enormous amount to do in terms of, of addressing this particular concern about poverty and race really playing such a huge role in the death toll. First is, you know, we just have to do a better job of economic security for these populations because these are the folks that literally cannot afford to shelter in place. They can't stay at home and keep themselves out of circulation from this virus. Most of these folks, the nature of poverty is you got to work. And so these are the folks that are often home health aides or working in food service or other industries that are population, you know, their public facing positions. And so you get African-Americans and other low income people of color that are disproportionately exposed to this virus just by virtue of their their economic circumstances. They just don't have the money or the luxury to be able to stay at home, stay out of work. They have to go to work. And so they are really exposing themselves to this at a much higher rate. You know, it's just making these populations more economically resilient 
And the best way that we get there is by this universal public income or basic income that Andrew Yang made popular during his campaign. And now that is in the CARES Act and these, uh, you know, these $1,200 checks people are going to be getting, that really needs to continue indefinitely for as long as a lockdown is called for. Otherwise, you are literally forcing disproportionate numbers of African-Americans into the streets, into the public to go to to work, which they have to do. I mean, this thing has really kind of laid bare the fact that the vast majority of Americans don't even have $400 in liquidity to help pay for emergency expenses, as we've seen in countless uh, Federal Reserve studies. So, you know, the first vulnerability for this community is always going to be economic. And then secondarily, it's about their access to health care, their ability to pay for health care. Certainly in Louisiana, the historical racism and other access issues that have plagued African-Americans' access to health care. And then just making these communities in which they live more resilient. We are working on a big one right now in Baton Rouge mm. that we're getting very excited about where LSU has basically donated its old Memorial Stadium to us and a team of developers that we're working with, led by Roy Alston, that we are going to turn the old Memorial Stadium into a ginormous healthcare campus for underserved populations in West Baton Rouge. And it's going to have a core set of services that we know lower income communities are in desperate need of, like a walk-in clinic and access to primary care. We're going to have a community pharmacy there. We're going to have an adult and child daycare center that'll be multi-generational. We're going to have a hub there for community health workers and community pharmacists to train and do their residencies through LSU's College of Pharmacy. And uh, we're basically going to begin a campaign with Roy and his team to convert these types of public spaces or what were public spaces into uh, healthcare hubs that better address the needs of, of underserved, medically underserved populations, uh, as we see in Western Bad Rouge. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, I heard a little bit about that, read quite a bit about it as well. Um, and it's just wonderful what you're doing. And it obviously needs to be happening throughout the country. I kind of wanted to focus on private practices, independent providers. What, sure. what can they do to help? you know, regarding some of these public health issues. Uh, can they get involved with uh, with this particular project you're doing, you're rolling out in West Baton Rouge? The big drive in the West Baton Rouge project is to increase primary care. I mean, it is one of the worst urban underserved areas in the state. And so just expanding uh, the primary care capacity is going to be huge for this facility. I mean, if you want to think of this undertaking, it's sort of like we're building a shopping mall, then primary care always has to be, you know, the Neiman Marcus or the Macy's, the anchor store, the tent pole capability that you put in there and you build everything else around. So, you know, if there are private practice primary care docs out there or even specialists who are wondering what's going to happen to my specialty post pandemic, is it even relevant anymore? You know, those are great questions. And I think what's going to happen and one of the big effects of this pandemic is going to be that smaller physician practices are just going to end up going the way of Marcus Welby. I mean, you just cannot sustainably keep your doors open for an extended period when the best thing that you can do is telehealth visits. That gets very hard to maintain a brick and mortar presence of a small practice. And so I think the best advice that you can give to private practice docs in this environment is if you're having a revenue concern about the viability of your own practice, you know, the imperative is just to get bigger, you know, to either try to bring in more docs to your practice or join another practice that's bigger and with established relationships ideally with a local health system. Because post-pandemic, I mean, even pre-pandemic, guys, it was 
impossible for small physician practices to be able to keep up with the administrative costs of electronic medical records and everything else that uh, that docs are forced to do these days. And, you know, what this pandemic has done is a complete revenue disruption of a multi-month lockdown that very few physician practices, which are in, at their essence, a small business, you know, are going to be able to sustain. So, you know, I've got docs that I talk to that are considering specialty changes. Uh, my brother-in-law was a uh, was a very accomplished surgeon, but he's now completely reinvented himself as uh, an urgent care doc and he's loving it and he feels more relevant than ever and he's staying busy and he feels like he's contributing. So I think you're going to see some of that, but I think the the biggest trend that you're going to see is just a lot of consolidation of small physician practices, especially in states as hard hit as Louisiana. And those that uh, that survive and remain are just their imperative is going to be to get bigger and to offer a wider array of these kind of social determinants of health kinds of services that enable you to take risk from insurers. That's, you know, the indelible trend that you see happening here is that payers want docs to take more and more risk for the patients that they're serving. And that entails having to offer a much broader panel of services in order to meet that need. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, yeah. you know, it does in some ways. I, I really do think that prior to COVID, we had spoken to a lot of primary care physicians, whether that was pediatrician or a just a general internist, primary care provider, et cetera. And they were all coming up with different models whether that was, to your point, joining a larger group, coming up with subscription offerings, which seemed very interesting as well. I do think that, and I don't even call it post-pandemic, I call it post-quarantine. The pandemic is not going to go away in the next few months. Right, right. We'll still be here. And how you operate, do you combine with other forces? Sure. That certainly a, a, could be a very intelligent way to help share costs. I was talking to a uh, orthopedic surgeon who said to me, you know, the smaller practices may actually do better than some of the practices that are in the middle, you know, the people with like 10 mm -hmm. people, whereas mm -hmm. the larger practices, yes, just to your point, it's a little bit easier than, hey, you, you, you've got a chief operating officer, there's financial people, they're making decisions uh, uh, basically like, hey, hey, you orthopedic surgeons, you're not going to take a salary for the next couple of months, but we'll be able to keep everybody on and mm -hmm. then we'll take it from there. You get two or three people in a practice, they can have a conversation and have less of an ego conversation right. about what do we need to do for the next few months while we figure things out. You get a group of 10 or 12 surgeons, and I say this with love, I have lots of friends who are <laughs> surgeons, they have large egos. Yeah. Uh, you need to have one to be a good surgeon. There's no doubt in yeah. my mind. And they're all fighting, you know, about what to do. And they all know, quote, what to do. And they're going to have more difficulty. That was what he was saying. And we've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of different docs on this podcast offline as well about what to do next. But I'm, I'm kind of focused on these poor people who are, to your point, people of color, people of poverty, who don't have either don't have access to good health care, uh, yep. don't have the ability to simply, quote, shelter in place. It's one thing to shelter in place and have income. To your point, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for the $1,200 check, but what's next month? Because I, right. I, I didn't pay my rent. I, I didn't pay my utilities. Exactly, all right. of those things. And yeah, it's great that you can't evict me, but wow, what's that gonna do for me next month? And, and, and so I am hoping that we come up with some solutions that make sense. And we tend to stay away from the politics of things on this podcast, so I'll just leave it there so that we don't get into a long drawn out conversation about universal income and et cetera, et cetera. But from my perspective, as I'm listening to you, a lot of us feel helpless. What can we as citizens do to try to help? Is it about volunteerism? Is it about donating? Is that what it is for right now? I mean, the best thing to do is stay home. That's it. So simple. Just do that. If you're really feeling a need to be out there among humanity and doing something directly, go work at a food bank. I mean, every shot that you're seeing on the news is 10,000 people showing up at these food banks. Go help the folks who are 
at greatest risk and with the fewest options. Go help get homeless people yep. to shelters to get care. Go work at a food bank. Go do light tasks for healthcare workers just to help out. I mean, you can do so much just for these frontline personnel just by dropping them off a meal at night or by walking their dog three times a day when they're stuck on a 48 hour shift at the ER. Really the best thing you can do is stay home. If you can uh, write a check, write a check to meals on wheels because they are desperate right now as are most other social service organizations, helping seniors and the poor. And then think about how do we help our frontline personnel be more resilient and, you know, able to survive an extended deployment against this virus over the coming months. I mean, this is just not going to be something that goes away four weeks from now. We are still going to be, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, we're going to be dealing with this for years to come. And we have to help our frontline personnel be more resilient. So, you, again, if that's just as simple as dropping them off some food or walking their dog or however else you can help them continue doing what they're doing, that's where the need and the help will be greatest. Yeah, I, I think uh, donating money to uh, food banks, services that help out healthcare workers, all are just essential at this point right now here in new orleans i think there's something called red beans crew they try mm -hmm. to knock off uh, two birds uh, with one stone you donate money the money goes to restaurants to feed people who are not working in the restaurant business yep. which is part of our new orleans business yeah oh yeah um, and they do that by not only feeding those employees but they also then pick a hospital a day and they just feed you know the icu unit you know, yeah. at a particular local hospital. I loved your idea about like, if you got neighbors, et cetera, that need a little extra help and you need to go outside. Yeah. First of all, wear a mask. Yeah, absolutely. Wash your hands before you walk out. Wash yeah. your hands when you come back in. Yeah. All those small little things that didn't mean that much before the pandemic hit really mean a lot later. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I do agree with you. Those lines for food are very, very long. And there are a lot of people out there who used to work multiple jobs and thought they were fantastic having a few hundred dollars saved who are right now seeing that quickly go away. And they oh, yeah. are not like, I'm lucky enough to quote, complain about sitting at home and having to figure out what to watch on Netflix. Right. Oh, woe is me. That's not a big deal. Right. But there are people right now trying to figure out like, how do I feed my family right now? And yeah, you're right. Where's the next meal coming from? Where is my next meal coming from? Yeah. And I do think anybody listening to this, most of the people we talk to, that's not really a major concern. I get it. There are some people listening to this where that is a major concern. And to all of them, I'm donating what I can time and money wise. And I hope everybody else listening is yeah. or can afford to do it. Please. Exactly. Take the extra step. Take the extra step. I mean, if you're really feeling compelled to help, help those who are most vulnerable and help the helpers and do what you can to make our healthcare personnel and other frontline folks. I mean, even just, you know, the guys who are emptying your garbage bins, all these guys are absolutely, we're seeing now essential personnel. We pay them peanuts in exchange for this essential work. So, I mean, anything that we can do to make these frontline personnel more resilient and then just appreciated and, feel a little more secure about where they are in the world is really going to just be good for not just our local communities, but for society. I mean, this thing has really shown how pathetic the social safety net is in the United States. I mean, we spend less than 1% of our gross domestic product on our social safety net. And now is when we see the effect of that. What's fascinating is watching in situations like this, healthcare payers and healthcare providers basically look to as almost like a public utility that's responsible for everybody's health. The system really doesn't work well, obviously, as we've said, for lower income and minority folks. You know, in situations like this is when you see 
The fact that because health insurance companies are 100% at risk for all of the healthcare costs of their enrollees, that now is when you really see the huge effect of poverty mm-hmm. and a completely insufficient social safety net. And it all falls to insurers to make up the gap. So now for the first time, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana is really seeing the kinds of investments it needs to make in places like West Baton Rouge in order to better manage the costs of these populations. I mean, this is what brought our company, Nightingale, forward uh, a few months ago was just knowing that investing in our social safety net is probably the single best thing that you can do to support the health system right now. So our mission and the kinds of stuff that we do are to invest in big social determinant interventions like food security or housing security or adult and child daycare or transportation to doctor's appointments because these things reliably save three to eight X ROI of what you invested in the intervention. And sometimes it's even a lot more than that. I mean, two years ago, Geisinger did an incredible study where they found they were spending $300,000 per patient per year on their uncontrolled diabetics. So they started a medically appropriate meal delivery program for them. And within 14 months, they had knocked down the average cost of their uncontrolled diabetics to $48,000. So net of the cost of the meal preparation and the delivery, they saved almost $200,000 per patient per year just by feeding people, okay? And so that, to a guy like me, is an investable event that allows us to really look at a broad food security initiative in a place like Louisiana, which is, you know, just absolutely riddled with diabetes and yeah. other food related maladies um, that really shows us this is a replicable program that saves a staggering amount of money and that that money can then be the savings can then be reinvested back into that system to make it even more efficient and higher quality just by doing basic meeting basic human needs and this is where to our estimation the system really has to go especially in the middle of this pandemic this is really interesting john like this actually kind of reminds me of an episode that we recorded a while back with a guy named dan dunlop and he brought up the the group build health and going after some of the same kinds of issues that you're pointing out here trying to come up with new ways to get transportation to doctor's appointments, trying to come up with new ways um, to really pull organizations together that aren't used to working together. And, you know, hospitals working with the nonprofits in the area, working with the churches in the area, working with whichever groups have the most impact and the ability to connect. And 100% agree, like, we have to think differently. Like, we cannot keep doing what we're doing and expect things to get any better in that way. John, thank you so much for coming on the show. There's a ton that you've given me to think about for sure. And I'm sure our audience as well. I'm very excited to hear about the project that you guys are doing in our area for sure. That's yeah. that's very encouraging for this this state and, and I'm sure the other projects that you're working on as well. So John, Absolutely. thank you so much and, and we really appreciate it. And uh, guys, thank you so much for listening to the show today. Thanks again for tuning in to the Paradigm Shift of Healthcare. This program is brought to you by P3 Inbound, marketing for ortho, spine, and neuro practices. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. 